Hi, Misha here. This is one that I've been wanting to do for the better part of a year. But I've been putting it off not because I wasn't excited and didn't want to do it, but rather because I wanted to do it well. And then, of course, things get in the way. And whatnot. This is the British Short Brothers Sunderland flying boat. This was a long range patrol and bomber and is a very, very big model from Corgi. 172 scale die cast. And like a lot of corgis, it's true die cast. Like it's heavy. And this was really the biggest flying boat of its day. And the last flying boat to be in RES service. And um, it set a lot of records and had a lot of service during its time. It served for 20 years. It was in production for nearly 10 of those. It really dates back to the early 1930s. At that time, a race was on between aircraft manufacturers in the USA, United Kingdom, France, and Germany to make passenger transport across the Atlantic via air a reality. To that end, Short Brothers would start working on the S-23 Empire flying boat in 1933. And the military, the RAF, would release specifications for basically a militarized flying boat, which Short would begin working on as the S-25, later to be named the Sunderland. However, interestingly, the civilian version, the Empire Flying Boat, would get priority. And it would develop into a passenger flying boat that could carry about 24 people plus baggage. In 1934, specifications were really released and the competition was on. And in 1935, the RAF would select the S-25 design. In 1936, on July 4th, the S-23 Empire, the civilian version, would first fly. And by September 1937, the military variant prototype would be ready and it would first fly on October 16th of 1937 and they would actually make two test flights in that day it did quite well but they did send it back to the factory to make some modifications for example it went to a more powerful Pegasus engine they also tinkered with the wing sweep a bit over the winter of 1937-38 and then by March of 1938 the revised prototype would fly. By April the first production model would roll off the assembly line and then by May these would enter into extended testing. In fact they would set some range and endurance records. One of these would go 18 hours without refueling which was very impressive for the day and still impressive today, frankly. It would ultimately have a range of over 2,700 miles. And, um, yeah, by the summer of 1938, the RAF would get its first example. These would enter into service. It's the Mark I. And by September of 1939, when World War II would begin, 
there would be about 40 of these in British RAF and Coastal Command service. So yeah, I actually had to tape my cord up. This is the first model to set so high that it would catch it. Anyway, when uh, World War II began, the Mark I was in service, and initially it was used for patrol and to search and rescue. And uh, one of its earliest notorieties came on September 21st when it rescued 34 crew from the damaged merchantman Kensington. And that really showed its versatility. This really was half boat, half plane. It's over 85 feet long with a wingspan of nearly 113 feet. It actually has two decks. Crew could range anywhere from a minimum of seven up to a maximum of 11. Typically the added crew were gunners or other assistants. Top speed was just 210 miles per hour, but given what this is, it's understandable. Crew speed was a little under 180. Max altitude is pretty decent for what it is at 16,000 feet. This would have a various setups for weapons over its production. Maxing out with 16 303 caliber machine guns. A couple of 50 cal Brownings would also be tr used on certain variants. This was a bomber, so it carried bombs. It could, originally, it was meant to use 250 pound or 500 pounders, and the system was very unique. It um, carried the bombs internally, and there were doors on each side of the wings here, underneath, and these little tracks. And they would basically put the bombs on a rack and winch it out onto the wings and then drop them. Each wing could support about a thousand pounds. Early on they just used bombs. Later, as these would be used more and more for anti-submarine, they would start deploying these with depth charges as well. Inside, we have quite an interesting setup. Of course, we have a cockpit, but kind of hearkening more to the boat part, we have a crew cabin with six bunks. We have a small kitchenette. We even have a flush porcelain toilet. The porcelain was very important. <laughs> For military applications, one good feature this had was a small machine shop, a small fabrication and repair shop. Of course, it also had facilities for an anchor and a winch, because this could land on water, of course. In fact, it was primarily operated from water, although there were landing tackle that could be used. So inside it was, you know, honestly pretty spacious. Again, it could rescue 34 people from a ship. Early on, and this turret in the front is neat. It's here. Early on this would have Two machine, uh, excuse me, one machine gun, but this would be upgraded to two in 1940, two, three or three calibers. And it actually can retract back 
into the body. And what this did was give a small deck for mooring and anchoring like a boat. They would also toy around with waste guns. In the rear we have another turret. With up to four 303 machine guns. The top turret would actually be added later. Where are we at here? This guy here. And so it would not appear on all models. By 1940, the Sunderland, as it was christened, started to be used more and more in combat. For example, it went up against a flight of JU-88 Yonkers in April of 1940. And actually did well, shooting at least one down and damaging others. And then in July of 1940, the first confirmed kill of a U-boat was given to Sunderland. In 1941, during the Battle of Crete, these were used to transport soldiers. One Sunderland, moving as many as 82 at one time. The Mark I would be produced, about 75 of them. Most of them made by Short Brothers, but a few made by, back, by Blackburn as well. The Mark II would replace it in August of 1941. And the major difference, the Mark II would have... more powerful engines and would give a larger ammunition supply to the rear turret. It would actually not be in production that long. They would only make about 43. Well, it was replaced by the Mark III in December of 1941. And the Mark III basically took the upgrades of the Mark II and also went to a new hull design, more efficient hull design, to prevent kind of a suckage, <laughs> you know, on the water. They also had some early trouble with corrosion of rivets and stuff, so they tried to address this. And they would continue to play around with the armament. It's worth pointing out that in October of that year, this received the ASV Mark II radar which is an air to surface radar system to try to detect untru sea boots and that's what this one shows here with all the antennae and stuff kind of a convoluted complex system but gave it an early advantage in the u-boat war helped close the so-called Atlantic Gap and the Mark III would be the definitive model truly they would produce over 460. Again, with a mix from Shorts and Blackburn making a smaller number. And this would just continue to prove itself quite uh, valuable in certain situations during the war and honestly I think it lulled a lot of German fighters to thinking it was defenseless and because of that they underestimated it and uh, more than a few German fighters were either damaged or shot down by 
center lens. Hope I'm getting something on camera for you folks. As you can probably imagine, this is a difficult one for me. Stand sits very high. Well, in the middle of World War II, there would kind of be a back and forth between the Sunderland and German U-boats. They had integrated the ASV Mark II surface radar. And then in 1942, the German U-boats would respond with the Metox passive sensor, which could detect the radar, giving the U-boats warning that a Sunderland was in the area. So for a time, U-boat interceptions decreased. But then in 1943, the Sunderlands would come back with the AVS Mark III, which partially countered the Metox device, giving them the edge again a little bit. Between about 1940 and 1944, these would sink 43 German U-boats and 12 Italian U-boats, so a total of 55, at the cost of 10 Sunderlands shot down by U-boats. Still a fair trade, unfortunately, but that's how it goes. It's around the same time, 1943, that they introduced the 50 cal waste guns. Giving them a little more firepower to hopefully take out U-boats as they surfaced. And these would see other uses in combat. In 1942, a good number of Sunderlands, especially in the Far East, would be kind of stripped of armament. And used as passenger transports thanks to their very long range also cargo and even uh, mail delivery so yeah others would see dogfights seems like the Yonkers JU-88 was this plane's adversary the most famous incident happened on June 2nd 1943 at the Bay of Biscay eight ju 88 jumped a Sunderland it didn't go well for the JU-88s. While the Sunderland was damaged, and one crew member killed and others injured, the Sunderland made it back home. Three JU-88s were shot down, and at least two more were noticeably damaged, meaning this thing gave as good as it got. So this would continue to see air-to-air -air combat. And again, it's one of the few times when 303 cannons on such a type of bomber plane seemed like they were reasonably effective. But then again, this was doing a little bit different role than your other bombers. In 1944, they started trying out twin WASP engines in the Sunderland. And this resulted in February of 1945 in the adoption of the Mark V, which had the WASP engines. It also had a yet further improved radar. And this would be the final full production version. They would build 133 new Mark V flying boats. Excuse me, 155. And they would upgrade 33 older Sunderlands to the new standard re-engineering them and giving them a new radar. There were plans to continue purchasing the Sunderland, but of course with the end of the war, many contracts including additional Sunderlands were cancelled by the British. So the RAF Coastal Command would receive its last Sunderland on in June of 1946. Now these were used by allies, uh, namely France, started using these in 1943. New Zealand was also another major user. 
And just because no new Sunderlands were being made, doesn't mean they were out of British service quite yet. With 177 built over the years, excuse me, 777, you can tell I'm getting tired. <laughs> Apologies. You know, they would stick around. They were used to support operations in 1948 during the Berlin Airlift. Also, three squadrons of Sutherlands were flown out of Japan to support operations during the Korean War between 1950 and then even after the armistice until 1954 they were used. And this was pretty much the end of RAF frontline service. They would still be kept in support secondary roles. With the final, Sunderland retired out of the RAF British service in June of 1959, the French would soon retire theirs in 1960, but New Zealand, finding a good use for them, would keep theirs flying until 1967. So not bad. Pretty, pretty long service. Of course, a lot of them were stripped of their military gear and used more as search and rescue or cargo passenger. But yeah, this was a very important element in Britain's protecting its shipping lanes and also transport because these could operate from water. They're also very tough thanks to their size and just general shape. And I have to say, I, I eventually wasn't going to get this model, but Pete from Pete's Collectibles said it was really one of Corgi's nicest. And after getting it, I agree. Um, it has the articulated turrets, as you saw. It also has a really neat bomb system that I can't really do one-handed, but the doors on the fuselage drop down, and then bombs can slide out on the wings, and so you can show it either armed or unarmed, and just the whole mechanism is neat because it works much like the uh, the original. It does come with the landing gear tackle, if you'd like to show it, you know, land it on ground. Of course, it has the crew figures, and the cockpit, and turrets. And since it has the bombs and stuff inside, I, I'm just going to assume it does have the, the, the beds, the uh, kitchen, and most importantly, the little toilet. If there's not a little toilet inside here, don't tell me, because then that'll be just sad. <laughs> Of course, it also has spitting propellers, and it's, it's very metal, uh, very heavy. comes with a nice metal stand. Um, very little plastic on this, aside from like the guns and the radar antennae, things like that. But the wings, the hull, are all die-cast metal. Yeah, the, uh, the tail, the vertical is metal, the horizontals are plastic, I think. That's probably the biggest thing that's plastic on our other horizontals, and I think they did that for the patterning. Also for balance, I'm sure, to keep it from being too rear heavy. But yeah, in the past I've shown you Corgi's other bombers, and so I definitely wanted to show you this one. Flying boats are just simply cool. The only other one I have is the Catalina, which I've done a video on in the past, so you might check that out. It's also from Corgi. But, uh, but yeah, they do a handful of variants of these over at Corgi. This is kind of in a mid-war configuration, as it does have the top turret, but it has the older radar ASV. Well, like I said, I hope I got something on camera for you. I'm just happy I got through this without knocking my model over. It's It actually sits on a stand very stable, but man, it's big. Anywho, if you have any questions or comments... I'd appreciate that below, and if you could, as always, like, share, and subscribe. Otherwise, this is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.